why do you think it's so common for people who have codependency to feel guilty when they say no? Because they were programmed that way. So if you grew up with a parent who wanted you to caretake them, you were considered selfish if you said no. You had to do what that parent wanted. So you were taught to feel guilty. You were taught to feel selfish. You were taught that it was wrong. You were taught that you were supposed to sacrifice yourself to take care of others, that that was the way it is. And that can get layered with all kinds of other belief systems. Like there could be spiritual and religious belief systems on top of that. You know, you're not a good whatever, fill in the blank if you don't do this, if you don't honor your parents, if you don't sacrifice yourself in some way. People are taught that's what love is. And that's not love. You know, if we, if we can't set healthy boundaries with the people that are in our life, those probably aren't the right people for us to be with. Those tend to be relationships of inevitable harm. Even if the person isn't abusive, even if the person isn't, isn't an alcoholic or an addict, but simply sacrificing our values in order to keep the peace, in order to maintain a relationship that leads to the loss of self. And that's another thing that codependence recognizes this loss of self. Often they don't know who they are really because they're so used to taking care of everyone else or being what everybody else wants that they don't know they have the right to say, no, that's not for me. No, that's not me. This is me. This is what's okay with me. So I think it's, it's those layers and layers of programming that have taught us it's not okay to say no. Mm-hmm. So how does one get to know themselves. If people are watching right now being like, I don't know who the heck I am, you know, maybe they've gotten out of a relationship and or many relationships and have always just become what other people are or what their parents wanted them to be or what they tell themselves they should be, but they're not really sure who they are. Like, how does one start discovering such a thing? So the best place to start, I think, is to focus on your values. And most people don't consciously articulate what their values are. And that is what most matters to you. So it's about doing that inventory and really checking in, getting out paper, actually writing it down, what most matters to you in life. And I like to recommend a free association exercise where you just take a blank page and you just write in the middle something like, what matters to me, or I value, or this is important to me. And then give yourself five or 10 minutes to write things all over the page in no particular order, not editing anything, just writing things down and then stepping away from that a moment and then coming back and looking at what you wrote down. And then as you're evaluating all the things on that page that you wrote down, that's important to you, that matters to you, circle maybe the five most important priorities on that page. Those are probably your main core values. And so when we identify those values, we realize what matters to us, then we can set standards and boundaries around those things to protect those values. That way we're not sacrificing ourselves. When we know that, um, let's say, respect is an important boundary to us. And what does that look like? If we define what that looks like to us, then now we have a parameter with which we can evaluate other relationships in our life to see is this relationship compatible with my values? Do we have the same value? Do we define the word respect in the same way? Because we might be defining that in different ways and those ways might be incompatible. So identifying what most matters to us is a great place to start. And it's a powerful way to transform our relationship with ourself as well as our relationship with other people. Beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate your really applicable tools that people can start taking on right now. I love that. Um, So what about, this is something that I know a lot of people um, who struggle with codependency also struggle with, um, obsessive thinking, catastrophizing, really going into anxiety or fear about what's going to happen in the future. Do you have any suggestions for people who find themselves like in that really unhealthy thought process cycle um, and how to get out of that? Yeah. So when I would find myself in these moments, and sometimes I still do, the very first question I've now trained myself to ask is, what's real here? So what you'll find is that the catastrophizing thinking you're talking about, my brain would just naturally go to the worst case scenario. Somebody said something, something happened, and my brain immediately went to like the absolute worst possible scenario that can come out of that. Did that happen most of the time? No. 
but my brain was wired for that. If you have been through these experiences of trauma as a child, through abandonment as a child, your brain is just wired to do that. It's a survival mechanism. So in order to rewire that survival mechanism, and it's a process, it's, it's not going to happen just one time and then, oh, you know, now we're good and that's not going to happen anymore. It's a habit. It's a process. It takes time to retrain the nervous system. But if you can step away for a moment and recognize what's real here, like what, what do I really know is true? And then what are my assumptions? What kinds of assumptions am I making? What are the fears that are coming in that aren't necessarily real and true here right now? But that might be coming from my past experiences. It might be coming from that catastrophizing thinking that really helps to separate things and to see reality clear. Because I think sometimes that can really distort our perception of reality. And sometimes it just, it happens so naturally that our brain tricks us. Like we don't even realize it's happening when it's happening. Hmm. Yeah, I was just, I was having this thought of how sometimes when I meditate, I, I'll go like, right, it happens, it, it comes in, right? I'm, I'm sitting there meditating and like all of a sudden my mind is like off in the million, in this direction of catastrophe. And it's so, I was like, oh my gosh, right? Like there it is again. And it's so, yeah, it seems to be such a default way of thinking, especially again, for people who grew up in some kind of traumatic childhood, because if we grew up with you know, chaos, then yeah, that's where our mind is probably going to go or, or, or expect. So, um, awesome. Um, it's also, oh, go ahead. I was just say, it's also helpful to identify what those triggers are because often it'll be a thought about something or something someone says or a certain thing that happened. And if we can also identify like what those common triggers are that trigger the worst case scenario, because there tend to be similar patterns and usually it's based in the past. Once we identify those triggers, we can become more aware of them. We can work on them. And it's, it's like it gives us this tool to point at where we need to look in our own healing. Like what are the wounds that are still there? The things that are coming up. It's not, it's not because it just, it, that's the way it's going to be forever. It's because that was a past experience that got wired in. And now the nervous system is on hypervigilance for that same pattern to repeat because we don't want to repeat the same trauma but we can rewire and reprogram those things. 